Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to be joined by Natasha Miko. We do expect also Natasha for Lawrence to join us. We just don't know where he is at the moment. So we'll run um, as a duo until Lawrence joins yes. us for the treble. Uh, there's plenty to talk about. The first thing I want to do, because I've been meaning to talk about this all week and we always kind of run over time, is a wee update on the Celtics uh, women's team, Natasha, because there is a big game tomorrow night a uh, massive game actually we're playing the massive. we're playing the league leaders who are going for 14 titles in a row um, so bring us up to date since we really since we last covered the game Natasha Okay, when we last spoke, I think um, Celtic were two points behind Rangers um, and five points behind Glasgow City. The top two spots are key in the Women's League because they're the Champions League spots. And what we really see in the Women's League is that the top three teams, really, Glasgow City, Rangers, Celtic, are quite far ahead of the rest. Hibs are sort of clinging on in there, but they are quite far ahead of the rest. So the games against each other are really, really important. Celtic getting that win against Rangers a couple of weeks back was massive. That cut the deficit to two points on Rangers. And what we saw happen at the weekend was Glasgow City and Rangers play each other. So Celtic won their game against Motherwell earlier in the day. And then Glasgow City beat Rangers... So Celtic are now one point ahead of Rangers in second, still behind Glasgow City, but that second spot is absolutely massive if Celtic are going to get Champions League football next season, which would be an absolutely fantastic result for the girls this season. Um, Celtic do have a big game coming up. Celtic now have to play Glasgow City. Um, It will be a tough one. There's no getting around that. Glasgow City are a very, very strong team. Like you've said, Paul, they are going for 14 in a row for the season. Um, obviously, if Rangers win their game in Celtic, don't beat Glasgow City, the positions reverse. But all Celtic can do is is go out and keep winning. That's, you know, seven in a row now for mm-hmm. the girls. So someone's got to beat Glasgow City this season. So why not Celtic? They're on a great run. They're playing some really good football. They're scoring goals. So if they can get a result up against Glasgow City next, that would be absolutely fantastic. So fingers crossed for that. It will. It would be brilliant. And I mean, we will talk about this, but next season we could be following three teams wearing the hoops. Uh, The normal team, the men's team, the women's team, and also the Colts, and we'll have a wee chat about that. But tomorrow night, uh, Celtic State of Mind will cover the St. Johnson game half an hour before kickoff as normal. But um, there is a staggered kickoff with the women's game, so we'll be able to give you updates at half time and at full time. And then we'll stay a wee bit later and give you the full time roundup of the women's game as well. Massive game. Like you say, Champions League football at stake for the top two. It looks as though Glasgow City will, will be one of those teams. But, you know, Celtic could go out there and get a result tomorrow night. And I know that, uh, you know, Fran Alonso's got his own wee cult following, Russell Boyce being one of them. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I look forward to it. I really do. I actually do look forward to it. And we're keeping an eye on the game the other day against Motherwell when we done the, the Sunday bulletin as well. So something to look forward to. But um, we will be engaging with as many comments as possible because there is a headline, why Wednesday would be ideal for Celtic's Eddie Howe announcement. Now, um, we are hearing at a Celtic state of mind that Wednesday's a big day. Natasha, I'm not going to make a great deal about that because we probably could have given a date every single week for the last eight weeks. There's so much information flying about. But it does seem to be an open secret, certainly in amongst the kind of media, um, that Eddie Howe's a done deal and it's just a matter of when. So do you think it'll be this week? Ah. Uh. Well, if I had a parent for every time that I was told it was this week, then, yeah, I don't know. I think that it does seem to be a case of when rather than if. Mm -hmm. I think the deal is done. I think that the final pieces of the jigsaw are being put into place and there will be an announcement imminently, whether that's Wednesday, Thursday, next week, who knows? You know, it's got to the stage that I think the fans are almost... Whenever it'll be, it'll be now. Of course we want it sooner rather than later. But I think we're almost accepting of the fact that, you know, he's not going to come in until the summer anyway. But the sooner we hear an announcement, the better. It just stops the speculation. It stops the endless questioning of when it's going to happen. And while the media certainly portray and the fans certainly think that it is a done deal, the longer it's not confirmed as a done deal, that more the doubt starts to sort of creep in and there's that lingering concern that something could go wrong at the last minute. We've seen it with Celtic before, you know, the last time we tried to sign David Turnbull when we tried to sign Ivan Tony, yeah. things happen at the last minute with Celtic. So until the, you know, 
announcement is made, you have to sort of temper your expectations a little. So I'm hopeful it's happening soon. I'm cautiously optimistic until we see it in black and white on the Celtic website. But is it tomorrow? We shall see. Well, the thing is, um, you know, there's this big thing these days. There's so many outlets that uh, there's some people try and sell themselves off as in the know. And there are undoubtedly uh, people out there who are getting good information from good sources. So you've got to manage that and you've got to manage your own expectations because, as you say, we're at that point, Natasha, where you do want it to happen so that you can actually look further ahead um, into next season. And uh, JP every Thursday is on the countdown for the first fixture. And we do need a rebuild, which we'll be talking about today as well. But, yeah, there is a hint. There has uh, been mentioned that Wednesday is going to be the big Wednesday, which actually... It made me think back to, believe this or not, back in the 90s, I think it was, there was a band from Scotland called Big Wednesday and they released a song called Sliding In Like McGrain. That was their uh, single, Sliding In Like McGrain. And I remember Danny McGrain being on the front cover of the single, this Scottish band. So is it going to be a Big Wednesday? If so, uh, dig that song out tomorrow on YouTube. It might actually happen whilst we're on air. Which would be, which, which would be interesting as well. But another thing, and I don't think it's the whole reason for it. It may certainly be the reason for uh, the scheduling of the fans forum. But there is a fans forum taking place on Thursday night, or is it Thursday afternoon? Maybe actually, uh, maybe four mm-hmm. o'clock. And yeah. Dominic Mackay will be addressing the fans, and it will be, uh, I think it's a teams dial-in kind of meeting. So. Dominic Mackay uh, will be speaking to Celtic fans on Thursday. I think he'd get a much easier ride of it if we have announced Eddie the previous day, Natasha. Oh, I mean, absolutely. I have known them to cancel these fans' forums very last minute. And, you know, like this one, they arranged them very last minute as well. Um, which makes me think the timing is on purpose. They don't arrange these things without thinking about the timing. They don't cancel them without thinking about the timing. This is what makes me think that there is a specific reason for it being on the Thursday. I could be well wide of the mark. This is pure speculation. But imagine how they could take the wind out of the sails of this fans forum if they come in with a massive announcement on Wednesday. Picture the situation where they don't have a manager in place by the time the fans forum comes around. Mackay and whoever else is attending that forum on behalf of Celtic is going to get a seriously hard time from the fans Mm. in terms of lack of engagement, lack of communication, lack of progress. The questions will all be centred around who's the next manager, why have we heard nothing, what's the delay? If they come in with a big announcement tomorrow, those questions are gone. They've taken the wind out of the sails of those fans with these serious complaints about the fact we've taken so long to appoint a manager. That's the fans' key criticism. If they can remove that, Dominic gets a much easier time at his first fans forum. Maybe we're reading too much into it, but if I was in Dominic's position, that's what I would want to do. Mm, definitely. I'm going to bring in our esteemed colleague to make Here it a treble, because we used to be good at trebles, and it's Lawrence <laughs> Connolly. Lawrence, welcome to the show. Mate, hey, it's a pleasure to be on again. How are the pair of the both of you? It looks as though you're in, a co- you're in a courtroom. That's what it looks like. It sounds like that as well. It's a boardroom, mate. A boardroom, right. Is it is it the boardroom? It's not, mate, not yet. Actually, <laughs> now, one day. <laughs> what you've missed is uh, we had a wee update from Natasha on the, the women's game. Obviously, there's a big match tomorrow night and we'll be covering it on the Axon Bulletin, uh, the match day stuff tomorrow night. But we're also talking about the fact that um, we've heard... Um, Axom has heard that Wednesday's the big day this week we don't know what what to read into that but we're starting to put two and two together uh, fans forum on Thursday um, would you expect it on Wednesday Lawrence Conley well I, I know they've got season books to sell and a, a tour to do so it, it wouldn't surprise me uh, if they thought can I for once try to get ahead of the problem you know because they, they would if there's no manager and no announcement before a tour they would take a fair bit of criticism. Uh, I, I, I think even if they announce the manager, really the, the main problem has been lack of communication. Uh, mm-hmm. I think they still they've got a long way to go, haven't they? Uh, and and with the communicating things, at least there was a move towards that with the with the email that they sent out. Mm. You know whether you like the content or not, at least they were doing some effort at communicating. 
They were, they were. Um, I was going to ask you actually because we have discussed this time and time again, Natasha, around the lack of engagement and the communication. Mm-hmm. And some people may say you're never happy because uh, they've communicated and you're still talking about it. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if I mean email. I know it's direct, it's right into your inbox, people are complaining, non-season ticket holders got it, season ticket holders didn't, etc, etc. Um, but it was, or it sounded as though it was a holding email. Is it a holding email for Wednesday's big announcement? Who knows? Um, do you think that's an effective form of communication, uh, the one that they, they sent out? You know, I do I do sympathise with the club in a way because we've had various forms of communication. We had the video from Peter Lawwell. We didn't like that. We had the question and answer from Dermot Desmond that was put on the club website. Didn't like that. We had an email sent out to all the season ticket holders or maybe all the fans, I think. They don't like that. So I'm struggling. I get why they would struggle to see what they do next. I mean, I could suggest what they what they do next um, it would be to come on some form of fan media like this what better way to engage with a massive section of the support than to come on a show like this one and talk to talk to fans and engage directly with fans comments things like that that to me would be the ultimate way of engaging with the fans in the meantime they're going to continue to try various methods um and probably get criticised for them but I, I think you know why they're getting criticised is because they've not done it as a a, a one op, you know, they're only choosing one channel. You need to go where your audience is. If your audience is in multiple channels, mm. you need to use the multiple channels at the one time. Don't go, yeah. this is just going to be email, or that didn't work. This is just going to be video. You know, be an agile organization. You know, right, we're going to send an email on this. What's a video communication? What's an interview? What's a press release? All around about the one thing. It really seems kind of really peaceful to just now. It does. If an email, well, what's your strategy? You know, yeah. some of your clients are on emails because you'll know how many have signed up and how many have ticked the box saying don't contact me by email. So straight away you'll know what percentage of your audience you're not, you're not speaking to. So why wouldn't you speak to them? See, the big thing with that as well, Lawrence, is um, I did speak to someone who probably wrongly informed me that Celtic did have a database of two and a half million uh, which was made up of season ticket holders, former season ticket holders people who have bought a ticket on a one-off basis or something from the shop and they had a database of two and a half million so massive but you would expect that from Celtic but you ask yourself how relevant it is when you're sending out a blanket email you know rather than speaking to those who um are of the moment who are topical, who are season ticket holders or people who are tuning into to fan or mainstream media for updates, um, of which there are, you know, millions and millions on a daily basis. So I'm pretty sure that, um, you know, it's all connected. And there's a few other things I'm going to talk about today that I think are connected to what you always hear, this uh, bigger picture um, that Celtic are planning. And um, we're going to throw in quite a few things into the mix. Uh, the Celtic Colts idea, the Conor McGregor links, all this kind of stuff. And I think it all points to the bigger picture at Celtic. Now, uh, Natasha, you are going to be leaving us a wee bit early in the bulletin today. Uh, so thank you. Yeah. Lawrence for coming in because I would have just been talking <laughs> talking myself uh, tell us what, what are you up to at uh, the back of one today yeah so I have to shoot up early and it will be nothing to do with the chat from, from Paul or Lawrence um, I, I do have to leave slightly sharp um, mm. heading to Celtic Park for a bit of filming with BT today um, which I'm sure you'll see on your screens at some point um, but always nice to have an excuse to go and see Celtic Park in the sun isn't it it definitely is and I'm not going to say exactly what it is until it's confirmed but there might be another wee visit to a football stadium for you very shortly uh, Natasha as well representing Axom um, so yeah the managerial merry- merry-go-round continues and we've, we've touched on the Eddie Howe um, scenario Lawrence Patrick Murphy comes in Paddy Murphy with the impact of Covid and a terrible season if it is to be how, will we be in a position to sufficiently back them financially? We're better off than a lot of clubs, so hopefully we spend wisely. Um, this actually feeds into another discussion point around the strategy, uh, the transfer strategy, and um, how you know that's going to have to change anyway, Lawrence. But on the subject of, of Eddie Howe, there's so many managers, and this goes back to something Natasha said earlier, uh, every time a manager's moved on or a club is relegated and you're looking down south and um, you're hearing about rumours of, of managers uh, being in the frame for certain jobs, that does concern me because even a team that is getting relegated from the, the top division in England, 
they've got massive kind of pool in terms of finances. So you've got your parachute payment. You might try and get a manager like Eddie Howe who's out of work to come in and solve a problem. Um, and those clubs could certainly bargain a deal much bigger than Celtic's deal. That concerns me massively. Does it come down to that for you, or do you think that uh, when you look at Eddie Howe and where he is in his, in his um, career, he really needs to look at the example of Brendan Rodgers so that he can go back into English football football at a much higher level? We've got to kind of look at it and go, what's the motivating factors for him moving? Money's going to be one of them, but what are the other factors? The, the level of football he's playing at, what competition? So Champions League, you know, he's got a chance to qualify for that. He's got a chance to win things. That's surely another mo- motivating factor. We want a manager who wants to win. Mm. You, you don't want somebody that's happy to join uh, EPL and be mid-table. You know, yeah. where's your imagine? But well, for, for me anyway, you know, some managers may say mid-EPL is perhaps perceived by them to be higher than Celtic. But, so, yeah, money's a worry, but, I, you know, if he wants championship football over the chance of Champions League, it's probably a wrong manager anyway. My biggest uh, kind of concern there would be that a lot of managers would follow the money, Natasha. Uh, and I don't think that that was the sole motivation for Brendan Rodgers. I just think he wanted to go into a platform. And he, I also believe that he would see Leicester as a platform for his next move. I don't think he is where he wants to be. But he's seen Celtic as a, as a platform to get to Leicester. And I think he sees Leicester as a platform to get to one of the, the big six, if there is such a thing, the big six clubs in England. And I think that's where Brendan Rodgers Rodgers wants to be. If Eddie Howe, and I know that he's been a bit of a student of Brendan Rodgers um, throughout his career, if he wants to follow that that path, and managers do follow other managers' mm-hmm. paths, don't they? Um, you know, you, you look at even you look at someone like Jimmy Goodwin following the path of Jack Ross and, and in a very similar kind of way. Um, but I think that if Eddie Howe wants to get to where Brendan Rodgers is right now, which is much higher than Bournemouth, where he was before, then he would need to come to a, a club like Celtic because if you go to a Crystal Palace, for example, um, then I, I, I fear, as Lauren says, that you are really accepting mediocrity in terms of that division. You're going to be a bottom of the table um, manager. That's where you're going to be. And you might end up like someone like Sam Allardyce who never gets relegated. In that in that division, anything can happen. And we've seen that this season. You may end up like a, an Allardyce and then you know how quickly your stock can drop in English football. So mm-hmm. I actually don't have any of these concerns. But then I think back to when Ronnie Dyler was... Uh, announced as Celtic manager and we all knew that's because we'd gone so far down the line with other candidates and then we were left with a decision to make and we ended up going for our number two Yeah, I mean it's a concern isn't it for me, similarly to players who come to Celtic to use it as a platform look at players like Van Dijk and Dembele and Wanyama to come to Celtic excellent for you know Three, two, three, four years, and then use that to go on and improve their career, and that's fine because that's a model that Celtic are happy with. We nourish some of our own talent, we take some of the Scottish talent, and we bring in these years for a couple, bring in these players for a couple of years, and then sell them on for profit. That's the model we work with. There's no harm in doing that with managers as well. You know, it did work with Brendan Rodgers. You know, he could have left us slightly better. We all know that, um, but you do get this calibre of manager in Mm. if it is you know a two three four year cycle before they move on to something that they class as a bigger job then I'm fine with that that's the sort of manager that we want to be attracting similarly to the players we want players managers who have that ability that means that they can go and manage or play at that top level so if that means that we do only have them for two or three years before they use it as a platform to move on then that's the price they have to pay for that being our model and it's fine for me to be honest um in terms of the money and the financial side if celtic want it enough they can make it happen um i'm not saying that we're anywhere close to the finances of these big teams but they can they can attract these sort of managers like Hare and Rogers if they really, really want to. You know, if Dermot really wants to put his hand in his pocket and how's the man he wants, he can go out there and get him. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that I think he will. Um, I think it's got so far down the line with Hare, and I think it's so widely talked about that there would have been a leak from the club quashing it if it wasn't 
you know, if it wasn't accurate. Yeah. Um, we know that the club like leaking things to newspapers at the moment, apparently. Um, they could have quashed the story if they really wanted to, to avoid fans' hopes getting higher and then crashing them back down, mm-hmm. which makes me think that it is, it is far down the line with them and it's just a case of when. You know, when we're looking at the bigger picture, as I've mentioned a couple of times uh, on the broadcast today, this does tie into that as well. And I think that um, when we look at things like, and we'll talk about them all individually, the Conor McGregor story, um, talking about investing in Celtic, buying shares from Dermot Desmond. We look at the Colts team entering into the lower reaches of Scottish football. And then we look at us targeting a manager who is of for me, a much higher higher calibre than the manager who has departed the club, then one of the promises could well be the big thing um, is the British Super League. And I think that is what ties all of these things together. So if you've got someone like Conor McGregor who's worth a lot of money looking to invest, anybody investing in football right now would be looking to invest in Celtic because your your investment is going to go through the roof if Celtic are able to join the British Super League. And I've spoken to, obviously, quite recently, David Lowe about that um, and various other people who are on the business side of football who are looking at, well, if anyone invests in Celtic, it's because they want to make money. Guys like uh, you and me who buy some shares in Celtic want to have that certificate on the wall to say that I own a part of my football club and that it's all about pride and you would never part with it. But then the investment side of it, that's massive. So we'll talk about Conor McGregor, but you can also use it as a carrot if you're trying to attract a top manager and say, well, you know, come in for three years but we would expect that in this time period, we're actually going to be joining this and we're already down the line in the proposals and the, the negotiations. I also believe that's part of the reason Peter Lowell's going to stay at Celtic because he's going to be tasked with uh, the BSL, the British Super League. He's going to be tasked with that. And I also think it's part of the, the Colts because if it wasn't, why have we we're not really, uh, you know, pursued that uh, with so much gusto in the past. We've had so many years where we could have pushed for a coach team in uh, the Scottish leagues. The first time we proposed the idea was in 1968. So why is it so relevant now? Uh, and I think it all ties in to the one big thing, which is the British Super League and by God, it'll be a big bullet in that day when that's announced because um, I'm pretty sure there'll be plenty of fans unhappy with it. We've spoken about losing the identity of the football club and things like that, Natasha. But do you feel that that massive uh, key element of of Celtic Football Club's future is playing a part in a lot of the, the goings on at the club at the moment? Absolutely. Um, any competent business, any competent board, um, that's a discussion for another time. Look to the future, not just one year down the line, two years, five years, ten years, longer. And think about you know trends, where things are going, how best to put the business in the best position to meet what's happening in these next five, ten years. You know, that's what the board will be looking to. If they see that the end goal somewhere along that path is the sort of British Super League, they have to get prepared for that now and they start having to put plans in place that allow us to be in the best position possible for when something like that does happen. So I do think this idea of the Colts team certainly has that in mind and certainly has this sort of change and restructure thinking at the forefront of their minds. Um, Whether it's good for Scottish football or whether it's good for Celtic is perhaps another debate we could have. Um, I can see it both sides. I think it would be good I think it'd be good for both. You know, this cash injection that the lower league is getting mm. is is massive for them, you know, and I don't see another opportunity for them to have such a cash injection. And that has to be seen as a benefit. I see the concerns that they have and I recognise them, but I just think that the the positives, not only for the lower league clubs, but also for Celtic, selfishly, um, outweigh the, the concerns that they have. Definitely. Um, we're going to speak about the Colts team, uh, Lawrence. Before I do that, I'll ask you, you know, will Celtic be using that as a carrot to the likes of Eddie Howe? You know, we have bigger plans in place here. We do look to be moving out of Scottish football. I don't know if they'd mentioned moving out of Scottish football. How, how, I know there'll be an NDA signed, but, you know, I, I don't know. I think that information would be kept within a club. Bigger plans and talk, talk about Europe, perhaps, but if it's going to be a BSL, I don't think they'll release that particular piece of information. I, I think that doesn't matter what NDA is signed. I think that'd be too risky for them to get it get out. I think that'll be kept close to probably Derek, Peter, and maybe one or two other, maybe Michael Nicholson and, and someone else in the club, just whoever's tasked with that 
bring it on board. Obviously, Michael will do the legal, Peter will do the negotiation, and, and Dermot, and maybe you know someone else. But I think that'd be. I should be sewn up pretty tightly if that's where the move's going to be. When we are looking at the the Colts team then, uh, I've heard a lot of criticism uh, around this being for the benefit of just two clubs. Now, although, you know, there's a kind of attitude, if you speak to anyone who doesn't support Celtic or Rangers, they do have that kind of idea in their mind that it's everything is to the benefit of the two big Glasgow clubs and um, it's interesting actually to see how others view us as a football club when you speak to a Hearts fan or a Dundee United fan and um, there was actually a very good play on Scottish football show on the channel on Monday night and the three guys on it um, brilliant actually I think they're, they're a good mix but they're all jambos they're all Hearts fans and so you get, an, you get an idea of how other fans view Celtic Football Club trying to get a team a coach team into the league um, do you subscribe to that Lawrence that it is only for the benefit of Celtic and Rangers I'm not sure if you're thinking uh, you're thinking or, or if you're frozen I'm not sure sorry you froze there for a second Lawrence I, I think we're only doing it because it benefits us. I don't think we're doing it because of spin-off benefits, although I think, I agree with Natasha, there will be spin-off benefits. Mm. But I think the motivation is purely selfish. Yeah. So, I, yeah think, I, I think it... Yeah, I agree. I think it is. But then, in order to sell it to the league, you're going to give them all the benefits. And the benefits would be, obviously, the bounty of 50 grand. Because in that league, they don't have any prize money. So you win the league, you don't get prize money for it. So at the moment, that's 50 grand the clubs don't have. You then look at... Uh, potential broadcasting deals be that a virtual broadcasting deal or you know some kind of channel who wants to cover it I think it'd be fantastic for the league if that if that were to happen um, and sponsorship a lot of these clubs you know they really are on a shoestring I mean when you look at some of the, the clubs in the top league who operate on, on a shoestring and, and in the championship you know Dunfermline have had an insight into the, the way the club is run very well now I've got to say but everything it's pounds and pence and it's very tight They've had some really big investment actually from um, German, a German group, one of whom was involved in St. Pauli. So I would love to see uh, the pars, uh, probably Mickey Mikevich would uh, need to work on the, the designs for some uh, St. Pauli-esque merch for Dunfermline Athletic. But when you're looking at the, the financial element of that, I know that the deal is for one season only, Natasha. Is that so that Celtic and Rangers can say after the season's up, look at what you've got as a result of us being here. And that could also be in the gate receipts, you know, going along to the games. It's like you say, that thrill to be back in a football stadium, um, you know, that's something that I think, I don't think we took it for granted, but we've definitely looked at it over the the last year. Uh, Yeah, I will be going to watch Celtic's women team uh, next season. I will be watching the Colts if if, uh, possible, as well as the the first team. So gate receipts, sponsorship, Mm. broadcasting deal, plus the bounty after the first season, I'm pretty sure they'll be looking to renegotiate that. Yeah, I think that Celtic and Rangers must be very confident that it is going to work. So you can pitch it to them as a one-year thing. And if it doesn't work, we'll reassess. It's just one year. What have you got to lose? They're obviously very confident that these clubs are going to be impressed after one year, that it is going to work after one year, that they are going to see the benefits. And Celtic and Rangers must think that they only need to get in the door, show them what they can achieve by allowing this, and then it'll flow smoothly from there. And I think they're probably right, to be honest. Like you've said, I think once these teams see the benefits that can come from this, they will realise that it helps them as well and that they will be happy to sort of renegotiate a deal for years going down. All Celtic needs to do is prove it over one year Mm -hmm. and see where it goes from there. And I think they will. Um, I think that it will be a good thing, not only for Celtic, but for the the rest of the the league as well. I do. I see some of the other sort of you know wider you know fringe complaints about the fact that these Colts players could be going to enhance some of these lower league teams instead. Um, some of the you know lower league, this even you know the Championship League One teams who do take players from Celtic, who do take players from Rangers mm. and supplement their own teams with them, and that's quite you know an important source for them. Similarly, do we look to Europe for these sort of players, or we take loan players from Man City? These lower teams look to the clubs like Celtic and Rangers, and if we're starting Colts teams, they lose that stream of player yeah. coming in. So I get that concern as well, but. We're a Celtic state of mind on here and I'm going to be selfish. Um, I like the idea of all the players sticking together, playing together in one Colts team, playing under yeah. a Celtic umbrella, learning to play in the same way. A much smoother transition to the first team if they've already been part of a Celtic team. Um, 
so for me, I like it. I I understand the concerns of some of the teams, but I like it. There's another big kind of question around whether or not Lawrence, this is another way of ensuring that Celtic have a presence in Scottish football should we go to the British Super League um, but I also look at a lot of the top European managers who you know I'm going to use a, an example in Rafa Benitez so you start off your managerial career in the B team you're managing a B team the reserves and if you do well in the B team you might make the step up to the first team so also might implement a structure that at the moment we really don't have do we I mean yeah you can get promoted from within but I don't think that that always necessarily works in the modern game but if you're a success and you know the you know the actual approach of a Celtic team the style of a Celtic team the idea would be that you know any right back could step up to the first team because they know the style of play and it goes right down the, the ages and I think all the big clubs implement that well Benitez might not be a good example because apparently he's only interested in the first 11 that he picks on a Saturday but um, do you think it's also a way of getting a, a young manager uh, experience and he, uh, again you know you then don't expect that manager to leave elsewhere he might be the next Celtic manager uh, do you think that could be a process or do you think there would be far too much of the view that you know it's only Scotland's fifth tier you know if you do well in there it shouldn't really um, mean that you're good enough to be the Celtic manager depends how well, well he does doesn't it depends on the situation at the time but someone whoever the manager is going to be is, you can't argue he's getting experience in a competitive environment same with mm. the players Mm-hmm. Whether they can make the step up, who knows? But you know they're doing it away from the pressure of Celtic first team, so it's definitely a benefit. It reduces the risk to Celtic if you were to make the choice to step up. At least you've seen them in a competitive environment, whether it's player or manager. And I suppose in any change, you want to reduce the risk, don't you? And if it's something that can reduce risk for us, brilliant. Ah, definitely. Um, the comments are still coming in around Eddie Howe. As we've said, we're throwing a cat amongst the pigeons by saying it's going to be a big Wednesday this week. Uh, you and Stars, we need to announce how sooner rather than later, uh, or this rebuild will be even longer than we think. Not long to go till the Champions League qualifiers. I think tomorrow, or Thursday rather, it will be 68 days if my maths is right from last week, JP will let us know. Uh, and we will need to get a fit team by then. Absolutely. Uh, you and now the outgoing manager, uh, the departed manager rather, and Neil Lennon, uh, some feel that the narrative of a Celtic state of mind has been very much in favour of uh, Lennon's departure. So we're going to open that up tomorrow on the dial in show, Natasha. We are going to ask um, a very vocal Celtic supporter to come on the show and offer us the case for the defence tomorrow. He's going to come in and defend Neil Lennon, and that's going to be part of the dial in show. So fantastic to get yeah. other people's views on it, isn't it? That's it. We always like to have different viewpoints on the show and maybe we do all think too similarly. You might not see that. We do disagree a lot on here. I saw it on Sunday. I've seen it before. We do disagree on here. But it's always nice to hear from other people, other supporters who do have a completely different narrative. And let's not make it a one-way discussion. Let's hear the other narrative and hear other views about why the season unfolded the way it did. Um, we always like to challenge our own viewpoints here on Axom, so the dial-in show on Wednesdays is a great idea. I like having other supporters come on and listen to other people's opinions. Make sure you consider your own sometimes as well. Expand your own knowledge, expand your own thoughts. So always, always grateful for people coming on on a Wednesday. Definitely. And we are open to that. And we keep saying it. We've, we've got uh, Wednesday's guests lined up for this week. But uh, keep sending the emails. If I've not got back to you yet, I definitely will. I'll get back to everybody that gets in touch. And uh, we'll get everybody lined up and get you involved. Uh, other discussion points for tomorrow will include uh, Scott Coyles coming on from the uh, Belgian football podcast. He's going to come on and talk about Jack Hendry. He's going to give us a, a blow by blow account of Hendry's season. And he's going to you know, give us his opinion on whether or not Jack Hendry has a future at Celtic. And I think it's important to speak to someone who has got a keen eye on the game and has seen a lot more football that Jack Hendry's played this season. I can almost uh, see the, the comments coming in saying, Paul, would you shut up about Jack Hendry coming back to Celtic? Um, but, you know, I've already given you the... the supposed uh, line-up for the first fixture in 68 days and Henry's in it at the moment um, if Ayer was to leave um, Lawrence, you were a massive supporter of Neil Lennon I think you were one of the the last uh, Axon contributors to concede that his time was up uh, will you be looking forward to seeing some of the reasons for the defence tomorrow? 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, listen, I, I think we've acknowledged a lot of them. Yeah, he didn't get to pick his backroom star. He didn't get his first three choices of transfers. He didn't get wingers when he asked for them. So I, I think we've explored all that. But even with those reasons, I think, you know, there, there came a point. You know, it was time for change. Yeah, absolutely. Well, now, there, there is going to be a wee change because Natasha has other media commitments this afternoon. So thank you very much, Natasha. And um, we we'll look forward to seeing how that goes uh, when it screens yes. on BT Sport. Any yes, idea when it's going to be? Um, not yet. I'll let you know via Twitter. But I just want to remind everyone, Axon is definitely my priority. It is number one. I did manage to still fit it in today, albeit cutting it slightly short. Um but yeah, no, hopefully by the next time I'm on, Eddie Hare will have been announced as manager. We can talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. I look forward to that and all the best for today. Right, Thanks, guys. Natasha. Thank you. <laughs> now, Lawrence, uh, you were the subject of conversation yesterday, I think it was, um, on, in fact, it was Sunday, uh, on the Axon Bulletin. So we'll have a wee chat about your thoughts on that as well. Not in a bad way, I've got to say. Um, but I have been talking about the potential signings uh, that Celtic will be making and the change in transfer strategy. So Colin Watt and I go toe-to-toe on the Lewis Ferguson debate. That's fine. It's all about opinions. I think it would be a good addition. But a lot of the names that seem to be getting ta- you know, targeted or certainly linked to Celtic, Ali McCann of St Johnston, Josh Doig of Hibs, Lewis Ferguson of Aberdeen, Alan Campbell in Motherwell, um, as well as Jamie McGrath at St Mirren. Uh, not all Scottish um, players as such, but all in the Scottish game, Lawrence. Is that where we're going to be uh, this pre-season? Surely, uh, you know, someone like Ferguson is on the shortlist for Young Player of the Year. Mm. Crazy not to look at him. <laughs> you, you know, it just... It, 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 we've got to look at all markets and, you know, we should have a great knowledge of the Scottish game. It's easier for us to cover it as a club. Uh, but... You know, I, I, for me, I'd, I'd definitely take Lewis Ferguson. Uh, I think he would improve by moving to a better team. Mm-hmm. Uh, he'd add a bit of steel that's been missing, uh, the high energy player. As I said, he's on a short list for a young player year for, uh, or young player year for a reason. So, yeah, definitely grab him. And I, I think it's a market Celtic need to be farming better than I think so. Yeah, I think so, Lawrence. I, th- I just, you know, David Turnbull is the shining example of that, isn't he? He's come in, and some might say that his earlier performances were better after the Lille game, that is. Um, possibly, but, you know, he's been playing in a struggling side. He's been playing in a struggling side, and I think you know, the very fact that he was nominated for the Young Player of the Year award, of, of which, obviously, Josh Doy won, then um, it shows you that he's, he's made a good positive impact and I'm looking forward to seeing him uh, progressing next season as well some have said uh, today on Twitter on the subject of uh, Alan Campbell for example that you know Sorrow will be playing a lot more games next season and he will but you know we're going to have to strengthen just about every position um, you know throughout the team and I, and I like the look of all these players uh, and I think that when you look at the success of, of Turnbull and you look at the successes of some of the Scottish based players that we missed out on as well Lawrence I'm not going to go through them because you know it's the same old names but we missed out on them and they've gone on to have phenomenal careers if you don't go and buy someone like Josh Doig this pre-season and he goes down south and he does a Robertson he'll never play for Celtic because he'll be way out of our price range and when, when you're looking at the wages we just can't afford a player once he's gone down to the English riches so I think the time is now for a player like Josh Doig yeah d- d- definitely um, you know I don't see why we wouldn't look at someone that's excelled, already excelled in a Scottish game. They've proven they can handle the environment up here, mm-hmm. you know, the, the style of football up here. Uh, and yeah, you know, would we ever sign John McGinn now? I doubt it, as you've touched on for wages. Unless the British Super League happens or there's another change in uh, the way the, I was going to call it the Champions League, but we better find a different name for it. I don't know, Europe's premier competition, I don't know. Uh, it's structured then perhaps if we can tap, tap into money, uh, then we can compete. But as it sits just now, yeah, once they're in the, the Premier League, it's kind of hard for us to compete. It, it is. Yeah, it's almost impossible, Lawrence. And you've got that ambition, the burning ambition of domestic uh, players who generally will be a fan, you would think, of uh, ourselves or Rangers, obviously. Not always, but a, a huge percentage of them will be. And John McGinn wanted to play for Celtic. He, uh, you know, made that pretty clear. He wanted to sign for the club. 
He's uh, obviously his grandfather had been the chairman at the club. He'd been uh, a long association with the family. He wanted to play for Celtic, and he made it clear. And you know, the the money. And I know it was a few years before, but the money we were talking about, we spent more than that to bring Patrick Clamalla to the club, Lawrence. You know, so I think the strategy, the transfer uh, policy, um, you know, it's run its course and it needs to change. And I think a big part, not solely, but a big part, will be domestic purchases. Yeah, definitely. Listen, I think you know, McGinn's not that. He knew it was probably a case of never, never for Celtic at that point in his career. You know, because he knew that he was good enough to play in the EPL. So mm. perhaps he. You know, play for Celtic, take that off the box, and then get my move because it, 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 he knows once he's down there on the bigger wages, Celtic can't can't afford them. Uh, you know, and I think there's a, a few other players we maybe missed out in the past. McCarthy being one that you know people are talking about coming now. You're like, I, I'm, I'm not so sure. He's so injury prone now. By the way, if I if I keel over, Lawrence, you're going to have to finish the show because I got my vaccine today, uh, which is a bit of a contradiction when I've got an Ian Brown mug because I don't think Ian Brown's going to be getting his vaccine anytime soon, going by his Twitter account. Um, however, I did, and it's not kicked in yet. But if it does, and I keel over sing us a song or do something, keep us amused. Um, but let's have a wee chat because Tony was talking about um, the fact that there was a comment came through in the comment section um, saying that we owe Scottish football nothing. We have we should show no loyalty to Scottish football. The SFA have, have always hounded us and treated us different, different set of standards. Um, and if we get an opportunity to get out of Scottish football, we should do so. So that was the point that was made, and we threw it out to the contributors uh, on a Celtic state of mind. Tony disagreed. He felt that there should be a loyalty to the Scottish game um, and that a lot of the um, scenarios uh, or the theories around the treatment of Celtic were um, conspiratorial in nature. And I just said, you know, I'm going to pick this up with Lawrence um, and we can have a wee chat about Jim Farrah, etc. Uh, in, in, in a nutshell, when you look at any opportunity to, to, to move the club elsewhere, I'm, I'm with Natasha on this, I would be selfish as a Celtic fan, I would. I would be totally selfish and I would want to be uh, in a situation where the club is as good as it can possibly be. It achieves as much as it can possibly achieve. So that's bigger than any player, any manager or any loyalty to a specific league. I, I think personally, and I might get criticised for this, if that opportunity arises in the next three years, next couple of years, Celtic should take it. Um, and you know it wouldn't be waving the Scottish game goodbye because I think we've already got our Trojan horse in there we've already got the Scottish representatives as of next season in the coach team I think that is all part of the bigger and wider plan what would your view be I know Colin Colin Watt he's against it he would much rather we stayed in the Scottish game he likes the uh, the kind of romanticism of playing at these old Scottish grounds and travelling around the country I think there might be a newer fan base who would be of the view, Lawrence, let's get our, ourselves in, in amongst the big guns, uh, the English uh, Premier League. What, what's your thoughts on it? Yeah, for me, yeah, you've got to do what's best for the club. You know, and I, I suppose best is subjective, but if you look at what's ha- happening in Holland and Belgium, you know, the, 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 you know or Ajax are banned ban in Dutch football. You know, would we be any less Scottish by playing in a British league? It's, you know, things change. We've got to move with the times. Uh, if we do have ambitions to be the best and get back to, you know, the top in Europe, uh, it's a move that needs to be made. We need to find an income stream from somewhere and a football environment that's going to allow us to achieve that. And I don't think that's ever going to be Scotland. I think Scotland. You know, the worlds are going to align. There's going to be a... a a, a real set of circumstances, Lawrence, that will leave Celtic with a decision to make. And a massive part of that is going to be the very reason I went for a vaccine this morning. It's going to be COVID, the lockdown, the loss of earnings, the loss of um, you know income uh, over the last year. That's going to play a massive part because then if the situation arises, as a result of that, opportunities will arise uh, because there's going to be other clubs down south as well who are going to go to the wall. If, you know, that, that is much is true. I don't know what Scottish football is going to look like in a year's time. Um, so I think there's going to be a certain, a very specific certain cir- set of circumstances that will never present themselves again and will give Celtic the opportunity um, to flee the nest, as it were. Um, and I've heard a lot of Scottish football fans of other clubs saying, you know, don't let 
the door hit your backside on the way out. Um, but I think there's a naivety. Uh, there's a certain element of naivety in that as well, Lawrence, because I think the Celtic would be a massive loss to the Scottish game. But they will use that Celtic Colts team, by which time, um, who will be able to be promoted after season one, I would expect um, through the divisions to say well we are we are still investing in the Scottish game we've got a team in the Scottish League pyramid who are going to go through the leagues who are going to invest in and we're going to still bring attendances to your football grounds and I think it's all part of this bigger plan well I mean you've touched on circumstances there. I suppose the UK government politically uh, a British League would probably suit them now more than ever yeah, and, and who's to say that Aberdeen might not have ambitions to play in it at some point, or Hearts, or Hibs, or any any club in, in Scotland's top league? What will the pyramid look, structure look like? Would there be an opportunity for other Scottish clubs to eventually move in, into it uh, uh, and feed it? I don't, I don't think it's kind of only Celtic and, and Rangers that perhaps initially that might be the only move, but I don't think it would stop at that. You know, I, I think it would change the, the structure of football. Now, whether you, yeah, I think then the Scottish Premiership or you know, the other clubs that it would, would push, whether it be you know a promotion to the Championship, a promotion to the EP or BPL as it would be. I, I, I don't think it'd be just Scottish and Rangers, uh, Celtic and Rangers that push for that. I think it all Scottish clubs at, at the top of the and will look at the money there. What? Why should we be excluded from it? They may. They might want a piece of the pie. I guess. Uh, I don't think English football would entertain it. I really don't. I, I think they would entertain Celtic and Rangers, and I'm using both teams because, you know, whatever you may think in relation to any alliance, and I don't think there is any alliance between the clubs. Um, there certainly used to be a business alliance um, back in the day, um, previously. However, English football, for them, for the broadcasters, for the sponsors, and for the league, I think it's all about Celtic and Rangers. I don't think they would really be interested in a Hibs or a Hearts, even though they're capital clubs. You know, when you look at the support, Lawrence, uh, the worldwide fan base, the brands, is it going to em- enhance the brand? And then, you know, other clubs, I don't think would be um, in England would be up for that for that move either. So, so what would happen if Celtic and Rangers get demoted? You, you, you know, where are they going to go? Is it? The championship would then go to it's yeah it would be part of the English football pyramid then wouldn't it so we don't so why can not the other clubs they, they don't drop you back in no the point you're making is a good one because the Atlantic League remember Alan McDonald yeah. was raving about that and it was nine nations was it not did they not call them G nine I think it was yeah. the, the nine nations um, but you're you're uh, if you were relegated you were relegated back into your domestic league that's so, the way that works so the UK pyramid structure could change. You know, politically, it would probably be an expedient time to do it. I know outside of the kind of four home nations, uh, a lot of the national associations are a bit frustrated at four home nations getting uh, national teams. They should say it should only be a GB team. So th- there could be wider moves uh, ahead of that. I, d- I don't see why it should only be Celtic and Rangers. I can see they would, they would be the main draw. Mm. But see Aberdeen, Hearts, Hibs going, well, why couldn't we get part of that? You know, when our crowds go up, if we got a season of the championship, what kind of standard of players could we afford? What could it do for our club? So, uh, you know, I think COVID's going to put everything on the table, isn't it? Uh, it definitely is. Yeah. Um, all bets are off, as they say, uh, because obviously it's been written off time and time again, Lawrence. But circumstantially, this is something that will be on the table at some point in the not too distant future. And I'm pretty sure the fact that Peter Law's Potentially staying at Celtic is one of the reasons why he'll be staying at Celtic. It will be to uh, bring those negotiation skills to the table in relation to Celtic's proposal um, out of Scottish football. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, we've spoken, and quite rightly so, about Scott Brown over the last week or so. His Celtic career is coming to an end. And, you know, the successes that he's had, trophy-laden successes as a captain at Celtic, making over 600 appearances for the club, one of only 12 Celtic players in the history of the club to make over 500 appearances. I've called him a legend. Some have disagreed with that. Um, it's hard to define a legend. I think Scott Brown personifies that. He's not had the best of seasons. Of course he's not. But that's not... I, I don't think that's what we'll remind him, uh, remember Scott Brown of. But there was an incident um, as he was in the tunnel after uh, Rangers' latest victory against Celtic with the 4-1 game. Um, and, you know, it was involving a Rangers official at Lawrence, whereby they were goading Scott Brown. Um, 
and you, you look at that situation and you think, well, that's what's, that's what's going to happen now. Uh, Celtic Football Club, the players, the fans, everybody associated with the club will be goaded uh, by the Rangers' support the players, the officials, because that's what they're going to do unless we are able to wrestle that mantle back to Celtic Park. Um, do you think that, you know, not that incident, I'm just talking about the very fact that we have allowed this club to take uh, Celtic's title away after nine years of domination. Um, and it's going back to one of the points that was made earlier about the investment. Do you think Celtic will go all out um, to ensure? Because, I mean... People are saying, how much investment will you need to topple Rangers? We just need a, a good uh, a good manager. This is a team that, that has the momentum uh, of a, a season that, in the league anyway, could well be unbeaten. Lawrence, will they strengthen? I'm pretty sure they will, uh, moving into trying to, to get more riches in the Champions League. And it's not about looking over your shoulder at what the opposition's doing, but we cannot allow the complacency to continue at Celtic. We really need um, to go into the transfer market in a big way, be that the Scottish talents we've spoken about, supplementing and complementing them with players from overseas. Uh, but we cannot be complacent in this. Well, I mean, I'm looking at the team and I think we need a new keeper. First choice centre-half, first choice centre-middle, first choice centre-forward. You need a whole new spine. I, I know kind of people maybe look at Brendan and when Brendan came in and Jock Steen came in they didn't sign a lot of players themselves but I, I don't think the squad was as threadbare or as it, it's been allowed to become just now mm, yep. yeah I mean if you're to look at the spine of our team do you see a spine you know I as possibly going I, I, I don't fancy it at centre half I need to be better right back anyway Scott Brown's moved on Eddie will be going and when we look at our three keepers Everybody there's a lot. Of, the, 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 there's a lot of fringe players, and I, and the term fringe player could include players like Tom Rogic, Near Beaton, Olivier and Chamini comes back. There's a lot of players of that ilk, Lawrence, that I expect to go. And when you look at the potential uh, earnings of selling in a year ago to Porto or eighteen months ago to Porto, they're talking about eight million quid for him back then. And you ask yourself, how much? Could we actually get? We'll end up losing money on Olivia and Cham. Such has been not just the poor performances, but also the circumstances in terms of football finance and uh, moving into next season. So, you know, we did a, a dedicated podcast on looking at the squad, all the different options, who's going to leave, who's going to stay, and upwards of a dozen players will be leaving the building. Um, if you really were uh, to be brutal, up to 18 players might be leaving the building. That includes all the low knees as well and a few kind of younger players, Lawrence. Uh, so the investment, and, and I spoke about this the last time, Celtic uh, were in a situation where we stopped the 10. Rangers have done it this time. We stopped the 10. Rangers went out and spent 35 million quid under Advoca. Uh, that's the equivalent of 50, 55 million pounds in today's money so we're never going to be putting that kind of investment in is it, is it more of a two or three year kind of programme that Celtic are going to look at and if so will Celtic fans actually accept that these are kind of some of the questions I hope uh, that will be asked and answered on Thursday night during the, the forum with Dominic Mackay well any investment is something you want to return on and I suppose your return is going to be over the length of that player's contract. So if we've got plans for a, a BPL, it may increase the amount of, that we're willing to invest because we'll get a, a, a better return. So depending on what we think the likelihood of that is, it is going to affect how much we invest. A lot of players leaving, you know, a lot of them in big wages that are leaving. At least it will lower the wage bill uh, and give us something to play with on that side. We've talked about the new manager needs to be developing youth, giving them a, a, a win at the team. There's a lot of players you might say have been good servants like near, near Beaton, but if he hadn't been there, might, might Stephen Welsh have started sooner? Might have been mm. more experienced. Might have been other centre halves that have been at the club that might have got a chance and done a job, or even if only been a job for a season or two, then moved on. But he'd have built that youth pathway sooner. So I suppose there's a lot of variables, but if it's investment, you're talking investment's only made for return, isn't it? Uh, and our return is going to very much depend on what competitions we're in, whether that's yes. a chance. Or BPL? 
But the big problem that we've had previously, Lawrence, and a lot of Celtic fans' frustration lies with us, is that we've hedged our bets on the squad, hoping that we can scrape through the qualifiers into the riches of the Champions League group stages. We didn't make the investment that we hoped would be made to ensure our passage into the Champions League group stages. That must have been a massive frustration for Brennan Rodgers, and I'll ask him that question if I'm ever privileged enough to interview him, because I, I do keep asking Leicester for access to Brennan and I think that would be a fascinating interview. Now, I've got to say, uh, tomorrow's uh, dial-in show, it's the, the Wednesday dial-in show for a Celtic state of mind. We had a lot of people going on about, you should really go for a phone-in. No chance, I'm not doing that. Yeah, that'd be that'd be impossible uh, to do a, a phone in show. Um, but what we have decided to do is we've taken all the feedback uh, on board and we're doing a dial in show, Lawrence. And it needs to be managed. Of course, it needs to be managed. Um, we're not putting any plants in. But the first couple of weeks to try and trial the the concept and the format of it. We've had people like Kevin McCluskey, uh, Alan Morrison, Kevin Graham, even and. Um, to prove that he wasn't AWOL um, and also tomorrow we'll have David Slight David Slight has contributed in the past to a Celtic state of mind but um, another couple of really interesting guests tomorrow and, and I'm allowed to say this um, uh, a person of interest on Twitter because there are some very interesting Twitter accounts out there Lawrence and you're not quite sure who they might be but obviously Celtic minded they're of a Celtic state of mind stock um, so we will be speaking to at Great Pantheon 18 who wants to tell us why Neil Lennon um, obviously deserves a defence uh, there might be a narrative uh, he thinks and others may think that that uh, Axom has had throughout a season where get Lenny out and you know I don't I don't subscribe to that. I did want Neil Lennon to to leave. I wanted Celtic to make the change. I, I did. I said, I said that. There was never anything personal in respect of Neil Lennon's character. Um, so, yeah, we'll be taking uh, Great Pantheon 18's views on board and we'll be putting them out there for people to comment on. And we'll also uh, be speaking to Scott Coyle, who will be giving us the, the lowdown on Jack Hendry. Uh, because, again... I've thrown it out there a few times and Celtic fans have criticised Henry and said he's not good enough. We'll be asking Scott, who has a keen eye on Belgian football, as he appears on the Belgian Football Podcast. Should Jack Kendry come back to Celtic? Will he be able to contribute Lawrence Connolly? So that'll be an interesting one tomorrow. If you want to get involved in future editions of the Big dial on Axom, please get in touch because it happens every single Wednesday. Uh, in actual fact, I'll be presenting that one tomorrow with Amy. Colin will be joining us uh, at night time for the game against St Johnston I hate talking about Celtic games Lawrence being dead rubbers I really do um, it frustrates the life at me because no Celtic game for me is a dead rubber every game means something you always want to win the game um, how are we going to approach this we've been saying this for a while are we going to do anything different are we going to throw in a few players to give them game time do you expect Kennedy just to be true to form start with Scott Brown sentimentality same old same old yeah, I, I, th- I think that's exactly what John's going to do. Uh, and you know, if he does try something different, I think it's going to be even more frustrating. Go, listen, you actually had a chance when that would have been the payoff for you, but you could have demonstrated you could try something different and deliver something. I think he's been named to Lenny Day now, you know, because nothing changed. Uh, it's just, it, it was a lo- for me, it's a losing strategy. was a losing strategy for John, you know. If I don't mm. change anything, well, how much we just don't realise by not changing anything. If you don't, don't change anything and you win, well, was it really you? Because everything's much the same. If you don't change anything and you lose, well, but if you change something and you win, well, that was you, wasn't it? And I, I think he, he missed that opportunity. Some might say, you know, it was limited by players. Uh, I think something's ham- hampered us all season as, as wingers you know, uh, been missing. So, you know, hopefully James is playing. Uh, and you never know. It, it, it may surprise us and, and start Mikey as well, but I doubt it. I think it's just there. Uh, it's going to be the same old, same old from. Uh, well, I fear it will be. What we will see, um, we'll be covering the game. Uh, Colin Watt will be joining us Laura Bradburn will be covering the St Johnson game we'll also be covering the women's game against Glasgow City uh, who are going for 14 in a row so yeah Zinko Vicks comes in to say I'm off tomorrow this should be good I think it will be um, people are looking at Great Pantheon 18's Twitter account as we speak it's a locked account uh, but yeah he's given his views over the season uh, he or she has given their views over the season and uh, they'll be joining us tomorrow uh, and 
any comments or questions that come in, I will also be throwing them out uh, to our contributors as well. So let's have also a, a wee look at the, the story. I'm, I'm keen to hear your thoughts on this one, Lawrence, because we spoke about this yesterday with Anthony Haggerty. There was a story that broke on Twitter. It was a Q&A with Conor McGregor. And they were talking about Connor investing in Manchester United. I came into work uh, the following day and I seen the, the story breaking on Sky Sports, obviously ran with the Manchester United line. And they spoke to someone who is involved in one of the Manchester United channels who was going out on about scenes. This must be kind of like a, a young term that all the young kids use these days, Lawrence. Scenes at Old Trafford if Connor McGregor was involved. Uh, I was looking at it thinking, well, you know, he, he mentioned Celtic there. And, you know, as I say, I'm looking at this big picture of the British Super League. Anybody who wants to invest in Celtic would be doing so with a view to um, making a making a buck or two on their, their investment. But I also don't like the idea of, you know, Celtic being a plaything, Celtic being a fashion accessory almost, Lawrence. And we do see a lot of that, don't we? We see, you know, McGregor in the ring wearing a Kieran Tierney top and sparring and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and as much as it's good because you're seeing all the cool dudes and all the um, creative people out there uh, are Celtic fans, I do th- sometimes feel as though they're just using it. I mean, how often have they been at Celtic Park? Well, to be honest, it's got him in the news again, hasn't it? You know, it's he, he's good at marking himself, Conor McGregor. No one can uh, deny that. Would I want him running the club? Who would be better to run the club? And I, I've got to say, Dermot Desmond, you know, I'd choose him. 120 times out of 100 if it was between him and Conor McGregor but yeah I, I wouldn't like to think uh, of Celtic becoming anyone's play, play thing which I suppose we've given Desmond a fair amount of criticism, criticism. but at least they runs this as a business and doesn't put us in danger of, of going bust and getting liquid, liquidated and dying you know he's knows what he's doing with a club which I would fear that anyone coming in and use it as a play thing may put us at risk which, you know, you wouldn't want. And what happens when they get bored or what happens when they, you know, they, they move on? They've got something new. Who then funds the club or funds the contracts that they've got us into? Do you mm. think some kind of dodgy scheme to come up with the finances to do that? My biggest concern has always been, and I think that uh, Kevin Graham speaks quite well about it in relation to the faceless entities that might run your football club, you know, and be careful what you wish for and all of these different things that uh, we can associate with that. But we'll wrap up there, Lawrence, by saying that um, we hope it's a big Wednesday tomorrow, and if it is, we'll be covering it in detail. Join us for the dial and I'll be presenting it with Amy Canavan, and uh, we'll be talking to various Celtic fans coming on to offer their views on things such as Neil Lennon, the case for the defence, Jack Hendry, should he come back to Celtic next season, and various other points. So get involved. Uh, thank you for getting involved today on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Keep following us, subscribe to us on YouTube as well. We're growing the channel, there's loads and loads of plans to grow this channel and develop it out of lockdown because we've done most of this during a a lockdown phase and uh, hopefully we can develop it even further once we're allowed to leave the cell uh, that I've been sitting in for the last 12 months or so. Uh, All that's left for me to say, Lawrence Conley, thanks again for joining me on A Celtic State of Mind.